All of these things were of value. The corn was of value, the sheep was of value, and the sun was of value. All the owners looked for them. And all rejoiced when they were found. So that's the commonality of these three stories. Now during this time that Christ was speaking, Israel had turned away from God. Of course, Israel turned away from God frequently. And then they went back, and they went forward, and then they went back. And, and uh, it was like a seesaw thing. They're with the Lord, and everything's prospered, and then they get away from the Lord, and things go bad. And then they repent, and they go up. It's sort of like today. The farther we get away from the Lord, the worse things are going to get. Because there is a storm coming. So the Pharisees thought the solution was, we'll give them more laws. That'll fix the problem. Uh, they've got 630 or 603, depending on which way you, you figure. Uh, but we're gonna, we're gonna make sure that there, there's a law for every single thing. Uh, did that fix the problem? No. More laws never fix the problem. You gotta have a heart change. That fixes the problem. So compliance through fear doesn't work. Never has worked, never will work. Compliance through love, that works. Always has worked, always will work. So the Pharisees, they were critical of Jesus. In uh, chapter 15, verse one, that all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. So you got the sinners on one side that want to hear him. They want to hear what he has to say. Chapter two, or verse two. And the Pharisees and scribes complained saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Why did they say that? Why did they say, they point out, pointing fingers again, right? When you have a problem, it's a lot easier to point to somebody else, take the onus off you and give the onus to them, because they have the problem, not you. Pharisees wanted Christ to be like them. That's what they expected. We're doing the right thing. We got everything figured out. Just do what we say and we're good. They believed they were saved by race, not by grace. Isn't that true? We're the chosen people. We got it made. We're special. So that's a setting that we're, we're going to delve into today. So he, verse 3. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he finds it, finds it he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls his neighbor and friends together, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety and nine just persons who need no repentance. If we examine this story a little bit, how did the sheep get lost? He was with the the hundred, right? How, how did he get lost? Well, obviously he did something wrong. The sheep was through his own ignorance. He got lost. He didn't stay with the group. There's wisdom in staying with the group. Not everything works out well when you're always with the group, but there's wisdom staying with the group. You have support when you're with the group. When you're by yourself, you have to rely on yourself. And that's not good. The shepherd knew each of his sheep by name. That's why he knew that one was missing. The shepherd knows his people. He knows everybody. The sheep realized it was lost, but couldn't find its way back. So what does he do? He can't find his way back. He doesn't know where he is. He has to rely on the shepherd to come and get him. Isn't that right? If something's lost, you have to rely on the owner 
or the caretaker to come and find that which is lost. The sheep was one of a hundred. Do you think Christ would have died if it was just you? Isn't that comforting to know he would die if it was just you? Nobody else, just you. That's how much he loves you. I think we, we don't comprehend that sometimes. I know I don't. How can somebody love somebody that much? That they would risk everything, their life and everything, for one person. Another point of the story, I think, is uh, the sheep wasn't looking for the shepherd. The shepherd was looking for the sheep. Man does not look for God. God looks for man. It took me a long time to realize that. We don't seek God. He seeks us first. Isn't that why he came? To seek and save the lost? We weren't born to seek him. We were born to serve ourselves. That's our human nature. He came to seek us, look for us, to save us. To him, it's all about us, you and me. To us, it's all about us, not him. Big difference there. And once you're in God's possession, possession, he always keeps track of you. I know in all of our journeys we have uh, we have issues, we have problems, we have doubt. Like I said the last time, I never had doubt. I have questions, but I never had doubt. Of course, when you're an atheist for 40 years or so, uh, doubt is natural. So when you find out that there's a place where you don't have to doubt, it comes as a surprise, a good surprise, I might add. So the sheep was found and what does he do? He rejoices. What do you think God does when the sinner comes to him and acknowledges his need? Do you think he rejoices and says, ah, let's chalk another one up, let's go to the next one? No, I don't think he does that. God feels everything we feel. We cannot, we cannot comprehend, like God is a mystery, how a God that created this whole universe Everybody familiar with the, space, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope? They can look back in time. They see galaxies far off. To, to us, it's just a dot. And they're huge. They're billions of light years across. It's immense. And the one who created that, how can we know who he is? We know who he is by his love for us. That's why we know. Our finite minds can't comprehend how somebody can speak and it happens. Can't, you just can't, I can't comprehend that. Uh, they have now civilians going up in these various spacecrafts of Elon Musk and uh, the other guy that's got these uh, trips. And these are very brilliant men, they have very brilliant scientists working for them. In comparison to the guy, they are nothing. We are nothing, and yet he cares for us so much that he died for us. Incomprehensible. Just can't, can't comprehend that. Verse 8. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me. For I have found the peace which was lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the, of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Both, when the lost were found, they rejoiced. Great rejoicing in the lost found. You're never lost forever. But the choice of being found is not only the one seeking for you, it's your acceptance of those who find you. Once you find your prize, do you abandon the prize and say, well, if, if they get lost again, I'll, I'll try to find them. You keep track of them. You want to know where they are. You know they're susceptible, susceptible to being lost.
Did the coin have value? Yeah, the coin had value. It was a denarius, a day's wage. And she had 10 of these probably on a string, which was a custom back then, and she loses one. The question is, how did she lose that coin? The coin didn't lose itself. The coin can't get lost. How did the coin get lost? Either somebody took the coin or she misplaced it. But the fault was not the coins. The coin was still lost, but the fault was not the coins. We know because it says so that the coin was still in the house. The coin hasn't got feet and it can't go anywhere else. So she knows where the coin is. But she needed a light to see it clearly. You think the light here could be the Holy Spirit that gives you light to see things as they really are, not as you would like them to be? So it lightens up, it makes, things, it makes you aware of things. So she gets out her broom and she sweeps the floor. Now the floors back then were dirt. They weren't, you know, tile or rug or anything. They were dirt. So it's going to be difficult to find that coin. That's why she needed the light. So they lost sight of the coin, but the coin's still there. We know that. This is a story of a lost relationship, the relationship between that coin and that woman. It was very dear to her. She, obviously, she was poor. That coin was very precious to her, and she lost it. So she wanted to find that coin. People have value. Lost people have value. That's why God looks for them, because they have value. God has a, has a special place in his heart for the widow. You agree? Amen. You know, the unfortunate deserve our compassion. The lazy don't deserve our compassion. But the unfortunate, through no circumstance of their own, which this coin, no circumstance of his own, got lost. So for those who have no, no say over their lot in life, I think God expects us to help these people. Um, the coin has two sides, right? The coin has two sides, heads and tails, so to speak. They represent repentance and faith. You have to repent in order to be forgiven. Everybody agree? You have to repent. Isn't that what Christ said? Isn't that what John the Baptist says? You have to repent to be saved. God didn't come here to save us to, so we could do what we want. God here came here to save us so we could be like him. Because he is the epitome of what we want to be. Again, there is joy in finding those that are lost. They should be a focus of our attention, so to speak. Lost people, and there are many, and a lot of them have no idea that they're lost. They don't know. And I think through kindness, through acts of service, through friendship, through being there when they have a difficult time, lets them know that we care about them. It's important for us to talk to people. I have great faith, but I don't want to share it with anybody. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, I was raised Catholic, and the Catholics have these monasteries all over the world, in which certain orders of men and women, called cloisters, they uh, are in these abbeys, and some of them don't speak the rest of their lives. That's, that's their vow. They take a vow of, of uh, not speaking. And they just pray, and they pray. And it always struck me as, what are they doing for their fellow man? And the answer is nothing. I, I'm not criticizing them. What I'm saying is we were here to associate with other people, to help other people, to tell them about God. If I study about God and I find the wonders of God and don't tell anybody, that's selfishness. Okay, I'm gonna keep it to myself. I don't wanna share this. I think that's wrong. I think we should share it, and we do share it. Let's continue here. 
And then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. So the father gives the son what he wants. Now is the son in essence saying, Dad, I can't wait for you to die. I want mine now because I'm young and I need it now. Uh, I don't know about you, but if that was me, I'd be a little hesitant to give this <laughs> youngster. But the father, as understanding as he is, who he represents our father, says, I know what this is going to do to you, but I guess you've got to learn the hard way. So I'm going to give you what you ask for. Be careful of what you ask for. You never know what you're going to get. So he takes this money and he goes to a far country. He doesn't go to a country next door. Why do you think that is? Because he doesn't want the father to see what he's going to do. I want to do my own thing. I don't want to be bothered with conscience or any of that stuff. I want to go and do my own thing. So he goes to a far country. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to the far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. So it didn't take him long to go through the wealth that he had. And I would imagine, and see if you agree, that when he had money, he had friends. Right? I got money, I got friends. Hey, come on over here, I'll buy this, I'll buy this for you. You need a new camel, I'll buy you a new camel or a car or whatever. <laughs> But you have friends. You have friends because you have money, not because you have friends because they like you. They like what you can do for them. So anyway, he takes, he takes this money and, and he loses it all. Verse 14. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land and he began to be in want. You can't control circumstances all the time. There are some circumstances that are beyond your control. This famine happened irrespective of what he did. He just made it worse by being in a place he shouldn't have been. Fifteen. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him to his field to feed swine. Now he was a Jew. What more demeaning job can you have than feeding pigs when you're a Jew? <laughs> Isn't that the epitome of the pits, so to speak? Where are his friends now to help him? Disappeared. You don't see him anywhere, do you? None. 16, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the goods, with the pods that the swine ate, but no one gave him anything. He would have been satisfied to eat what the pigs were left over. And now he was really, really hurting. He was really destitute. But when he came to himself, when he understood his situation, really understood his situation, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger. He's looking back at his father now, servants were not slaves. Servants were hired people. Like if you hire a, a domestic worker, you hire a nurse, you hire whatever. They got a wage. They went home at night. They weren't a slave to the, to the owner. So he just wants to be a hired worker for his father. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Notice the order. I have sinned against heaven first, and then he sinned against his father. When Joseph was accused of making advances towards Potiphar's wife, what did Joseph say? How can I do such a thing and sin against heaven? He knew where the sin lies. 
Any sin we might do is an offense to God. That's why it causes separation. That's why it's so deadly. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. None of us are worthy to be called his son or his daughter. But the fact that he died makes us worthy. Don't ever forget that. When you're so low and you, there's no hope you think. Just think of how much it cost him to love you. That should give you hope to say, okay, I've fallen down, but I'm gonna get up. Just like this fella. Mm -hmm. He fell down, but he's going to get up. And he knows where to go, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. He goes to the Father. That's where he goes. He says, make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. It always struck me as his father saw him first. God seeks us first. Do you think the father sat back and says, when he has enough of this, he'll come home. I'll just wait for him and have him beg a little. Or do you think the father, I can just imagine, I know I've said this before, but I can just imagine the father lived on a hill and every day he went up that hill and looked for his son. See, is, he, is this the day he's gonna come home? Every day. I think that's why he saw him first. He was looking for his son. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. He repented. He admitted his mistake and he asked for forgiveness. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best the best robe and put it on him and put a ring in his hand and sandals on his feet. He didn't say to his son, I've got this robe that I'm gonna, I wanna dress you in, but go take a shower first because you really stink. I mean, you've been with the pigs and all that. He didn't say that, did he? He gave him the robe right away. Come just as you are and I will cover you. He gave him a ring. A ring is a symbol of authority. He treated him just like one of his own, like he never left. And that's what he does for us when we come to him. And sandals for his feet. Most people at that time had sandals, even the slaves. Evidently from reading this is what I understand is he came from this far country so poor and so defeated that he had nothing on his feet. His father shot his feet for him. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Let's have a feast, let's rejoice because the son is home. Now his older son was in the field and he came and drew near to the house and heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked, what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come home and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed a fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Who's got the problem here? Which son? Brother. Yeah. Although he stayed, his heart was not right. Otherwise he'd have been happy to see his brother but he was just angry to see his brother. We'll find out how angry when we keep reading. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. The father is trying to reason with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandments at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I may make merry with my friends. Was the purpose of the father killing the fatted cat to make merry with his friends. That wasn't, the, that wasn't the purpose. He was joyful because the son had come home. That was the purpose. This second son misses the whole point completely. What about me? See, it's all about him. What about me? You never did this for me. Those of us who have 
daughters or, I mean, uh, daughters or sons, we're a little bit careful not to favor one among another. You know how that can go. So you're, you're kind of careful. You want to treat everybody the same. But you don't stop praising the ones that do good and you don't stop correcting the ones that do bad. Otherwise, you have a dysfunctional family that will never recover. You have to tell it like it is. Sometimes we're hesitant to do that. You love them all equally. But obviously, there are some that do what you want because you are who you are, and there's some that do what they want because they are who they are. But as soon as the son, this son of yours, came who was devouring, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed a fatted calf. Look at the mistakes he made, he's telling his father. Look at the mistakes, he took all your money, and he, and he wasted on all this stuff that's, that's sinful. You, shouldn't, you should not be doing this for him. He's not rejoicing because he's found. He's upset because he figures that this guy took his money, made him do twice the work, and he's just ungrateful. He deserves what he's got. Leave him out there. Is that the way we treat our brother? This is this guy's brother. Not only is he another human being, but he's his brother. And does he seem to care? Not a bit. He's all worried about number one. I want number one. And he said to him, son, you are always with me. All that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother is dead and alive again, was lost, and now he's found. I think that's a great, great story. Um, the first son, he loved liberty more than his father. Didn't he? he wanted to do his own thing. But he found out that liberty comes with a cost. He was a slave to his own sinful nature. He couldn't get along without the things that he went to buy, thinking it would bring him happiness. But all it brought was misery. So when we think that we need something that's going to make us happy, you know, buy this car. This car will get all the girls for you. What happens when you crash the car? You think the girls will still be there? Mm -mm. Nope. When you put your faith in things instead of in God, your Father, bad things are going to happen. Because you have, once that's gone, where do you go? You have no place to go. But with God, you always have someone to go to. Uh, question that is unanswered is did the younger son repent? Doesn't say, does it? No. Doesn't say. How important is that? I don't think it's important at all. Sometimes we ask the wrong questions. The question is what do you do with someone who is lost when he repents? That's the gist of the story. Not what if, what if this, what if that. But these are, act, these are facts. The son left. The son repented. He was found. That's the story. That's why they're all in the same chapter. This is about lost and found. You notice the elder brother said, or the younger brother said, your son. He didn't even want to admit that he was his brother. Your son. You know, when you used to get married, I, I, I never had brothers or sisters, but I went, this is your, your son that did this, you know, pointing fingers. <clears throat> Everybody rejoiced in that household, right? No. Everybody but the one rejoiced. Everybody was happy that the son come home except one. Now you could take this to mean who will not rejoice when the sinners are brought to repentance. 
The devil is the only one that's happy. It's not happy. Everybody rejoices except Satan. I think these three stories indicate our condition. All of us can be lost. All of us can be lost for various reasons. Some out there don't know. Some out there know but don't care. Some have walked with the Lord and have walked away. But they're not hopeless. Nobody's hopeless. There is an opposite to lost and that's found. And, and God keeps that door open as long as you're open to it. You know, I, 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 I've said this before. To me, it's so profound is God does not determine your destiny. You do. And when you think about it, it's the choices you make, the people you associate with, and the things that you do will make a difference in your life. People that think there are no consequences to their actions are fooling themselves. There are consequences to your action. Everything you do will affect your eternal destiny, whether it be good or whether it be bad. But when you realize that there's a loving God that will accept you at any time that you're ready to come to him with open arms. He never has his back to you. He never turns around and says, not today. Now is the time to repent and come to him. Are we going to do a, a song? Yeah, okay. And then we'll, uh, we'll close. Can we stand for our closing pen on 206, please? On 206, face to face.